Uh, welcome back to part two of our introduction to modeling of ground heat exchangers. And we left off last time, we just introduced the line source <coughs> and showed this integral, which is called the exponential integral, sometimes denoted by uh, E sub 1. So you can see that in Hellstrom or in Gaussian Cahill, which is a chapter in a well known numerical methods book called, uh, or by Abramowitz and Stegen. <coughs> it's also sometimes called I. It's, uh, Jung uses that and Ingersoll and Plass use that. Um, it's tabulated in references such as Abramowitz and Stegen, right? and they also give some functional approximations. So for that, I would refer you to Gauchy and Cahill, 1964, again, a chapter in Abramowitz and Stegen. Young also gives a couple approximations that cover different ranges. So the simple, simple, probably simplest approximation is this one here, is that the, uh, the um, exponential integral of this quantity r squared over 4 alpha t is actually equal to the natural log of 4 alpha t over r squared minus gamma, which is Euler's constant. Right, and this is this uh, expression is typically claimed to have a maximum error of 2% when the quantity alpha t greater than r squared <coughs> is alpha t over r squared is greater than or equal to 5. And I just picked out as an example average rock with thermal diffusiv diffusivity of 7.4 times the neg negative seventh meter square per second, borehole diameter of 140 millimeters. T in that case at the limit is about five hours. Or at <clears throat> the T corresponding to a limit of five is about 9.2 hours. There's a, a Gauchy and Cahill give a, a series, infinite series expansion for this. So if you take the first two terms, two additional terms, they're here. Um, and uh, Hellstrom gives this as an approximation. Um, <clears throat> it has a maximum error of 1% when uh, the time alpha t over r squared, the time is greater than 0.5. So that would be less than an hour with our typical rock uh, problem. <clears throat> but I'll warn you that um, uh, this, this may well be true, but in fact, if you use it at smaller times, so for example, if you use it at 10 seconds, the simplest approximation will give you an answer. It's not, it won't be correct, but it will sort of be within the range of expectations or um, it doesn't go to infinity. <clears throat> this approximation will actually give very strange values when you get, if you try to use it with a very small time below, below what it should be used for. Um, so <clears throat> for now, we're just going to use the sort of simplest approximation, this one here. I might separately discuss this uh, history and the application of it. Um, you know, there's some interesting, in my view, points to be made, but maybe not, not in this lecture. Uh, also warn you several references, for example, Ingersoll and Plass and Carson and Jaeger both have typos. So this is correct what you see here, but um, unfortunately Carson and Jaeger come back to this solution. Unfortunately, they have the diffusivity here instead of the conductivity. And I've, uh, Ingersoll and Plass have, I think, a two inside the square root or where it should be outside the square root or something. There's some, there's some type of typographical error there too. So, okay, but you've got it correct here. Okay, so the line source is intended to give us the temperature at the borehole wall with a constant heat input, right? And as I mentioned before, this is an approximation because the borehole itself isn't filled with ground and of course the heat source isn't actually a line, right? The heat's coming in in the tubes, right? So what 
the way this is typically used is we use the line source to get the temperature of the borehole wall. And then we use a steady state borehole resistance to get the um, temperature of the fluid. And so if you see here's a temperature of fluid one, temperature of fluid two, uh, using the borehole resistance, we can estimate the mean value of the, the uh, fluid temperature. So this is one network that's used. Well, any network that you see like this is also an approximation, but you see the borehole wall, you see a resistance between fluid one and fluid two, and you note there's also some resistance here, which means there's a possibility for short circuiting. <clears throat> Slightly more elaborate diagram shows the two halves and assuming there's no heat transfer between them. Right, which would be the case if the we're, when we're estimating the mean fluid temperature, right, we're assuming we're just getting the average. Um, in that case, in the fluid temperature, you could imagine if this is the fluid temperature and this is the fluid temperature's two paths, there's the resistance of the fluid or the convective resistance at the inside wall of the pipe. There's the resistance of the pipe itself. And then there's the resistance of the, gr of the grout between the outer edge of the pipe wall and the borehole wall. <coughs> so sometimes it's expressed as shown here where the total borehole resistance is equal to the resistance of the grout. And this would be from the outside of both tubes to the borehole wall, plus the resistance of one pipe and one, con one convective resistance inside divided by two because there's two in parallel as, as shown here. So actually in this expression doesn't quite match this network. This network, it would, if you would connect these here and say there's a single grout, then this expression would be this network. Okay, the resistance for the pipe, right, that's easily, easily computed, so is the, resist, the convective resistance at the wall. I'll say it's easily computed. If you know the convection coefficient, we usually use some sort of correlation, like the didis bolter correlation or, or some other similar sort of correlation for flow inside a pipe. Right, the hard part is calculating the grout resistance. And we're gonna, we'll have a separate lecture on borehole resistance, but um, calculating the grout resistance, there's a number of ways it can be done. So uh, Yavuzturk uh, used a um, numerical method, finite volume method, with a, where the pipes in the method were fit to the grid. So it looked like they, we called them, uh, they looked kind of like pieces of pie, sort of. Um, but it could be made to work. Use the multipole method, originally developed in the 90s, but then it was never published other than in a, like a university report. So this 2011 paper was published in a journal. Uh, there's a shape factor method, which was developed by um, Neil Paul, a master's student at South Dakota State University under Chuck Raymond. Um, <clears throat> my colleague Sakib Javid and I, we, we did some extensive analysis of the accuracy of different methods. And what I would say, just as an aside here, is that the, uh, the multipole approach, as presented by Claussen and Hellstrom, um, it can be carried out to any order, but to do that, you need a computer program. Uh, I'd take a guess, maybe 500 lines of code, but I, that's just a guess. Um, <clears throat> There, more recently, Johan Clausen developed and uh, Sakib Javid developed some uh, lower order closed form expressions, right? And these two papers, which you can find all the references, or at least I think you can find all the references in the, uh, at the end of this PowerPoint, but these two papers show this, these uh, like first and second order approaches for single YouTube and double YouTube cases. It's probably the best. That is, they're very accurate and also relatively easy to compute. So,
Okay, so just going back um, to the different methods, the numerical procedures can work, but they generally have difficulty. Uh, this is a borehole with a, a U-tube where the tube's been pushed up against the wall. This is very difficult to fit with any kind of gridding approach. I mean, if you can imagine it, it eventually is tangent and then it forms this sort of <coughs> wedge-shaped curving gap. It's just a, <coughs> it can be hard to get a good new, um, a good fit for that case um, with the grid, which then makes the procedure a little bit hard to use. Uh, the multipole method is very accurately, accurate. Uh, in the case of a borehole that's cased, right, which is, I would say, fairly unusual, but not, not uh, not non-existent, may not be able to treat that quite properly. Um, but actually probably could do a, as reasonable approximation as anything else. Uh, the shape factor method, uh, when we used that in the late, late 90s, that was a big contribution. Uh, later we realized that there were some assumptions that were used even within uh, there was some experimental work, but it was designed um, in such a way that he didn't use fluid. He used a, a resistance wire wrapped around a tube. So it, it really was uniform flux at the pipe wall rather than uniform temperature inside. Um, until, yeah, until you look at this closely, it may seem like it doesn't make a difference, but it does. So <clears throat> um, reluctantly, or you know, we, we, well, we switched away from, from that method for that reason. And it works fine for some things, but for some, for some geometries and for others not as well. Okay, in addition to the um, resistance between the fluid and the borehole wall, there's also this uh, possibility for conduction of heat from the hot side of the tube to the cold side, right? Now, we, we refer to that as short circuiting, right? And it, one way of looking at it is to say it increases the effective borehole thermal resistance, right? So it's saying you have a resistance, but it's higher than it seems because of the short circuiting. So Jorn Hellstrom called this RB star, the effective borehole thermal resistance. Generally speaking, <coughs> RB star is always greater than RB. When I first got into this, oh, probably, 25 years ago when I was looking at this, I thought, well, <clears throat> it's not a big deal. I mean, I, I figured out what the effect was and, well, for a typical borehole that we use here that might be, say, 80 meters deep, 76 meters, 250 feet, that's pr pretty common, right? They're typically RB stars only a little bit larger, like, you know, it just might be off by a percent or two it's, or, or three percent. It's <clears throat> not really worth worrying about. Turns out, though, boreholes have gotten deeper here, and certainly in places like Scandinavia, if I remember right, the average borehole depth recently was, I think it was 186 meters. So, I mean, it's quite deep. In that case, you start to get a larger effect of the short circuiting, and you need to take account for it. It also happen if you have really low flow for some reason. All right, it's a little bit like um, heat exchanger effectiveness. It gets higher. Um, as the area gets greater, the flow rate gets lower, and in this case, we don't want a, that heat exchanger between the tubes to be that effective, right? Okay, so there's also been a fair amount of confusion over this, and I'll mention this. Um, now, some authors have, confu have uh, brought up the issue of how to determine the mean fluid temperature in the borehole. And they've rightly pointed out that the mean fluid temperature is not the simple mean of the entering fluid, entering fluid temperature and exiting fluid temperature from the borehole. That's true. And they've developed a range of procedures for estimating the actual mean fluid temperature, like in a thermal response test. That's fine too, but unfortunately, they didn't realize that RB star also treated this problem. So it treated like this was something new and different when really <clears throat> it's just another way to handle the short circuiting. So you can use RB star with the simple mean fluid temperature, or you could use RB, which you could think of as the local borehole resistance, 
with some kind of better estimate of what the, act, the mean fluid temperature actually is. Right, and for relatively shallow boreholes, say less than 100 meters, then you can probably just approximate RB star as RB. Right, there are expressions for RB star in Clausen and Hellstrom, also in your and Hellstrom's thesis. There are two limiting cases, the uniform borehole wall temperature and the uniform heat flux. Uh, probably in, with lack of better information, a mean value of the two limiting cases could be used. Okay, so that's all for part two.